uh, we need to keep going and we will do so by introducing our next guest who as a small child uh, witnessed some of the most turbulent moments in modern Irish life firsthand and was the son and close confidant of his father, Brian Lenehan Sr. throughout the Charlie Hawhey era. It's a time he's returned to with his new book, Hawhey, Prince of Power. So would you welcome to talk about that please, Conor Lenehan. See, uh, you, you discussed the idea of writing this book with Charles Hawkey himself. Uh, tell us a bit about well, that. It's a long, long, long time ago. Yeah. I was actually a minister at the time, but I was out in Malahide, and I used to, when I was out that part of the city, I'd, I'd give him a call. He was basically, I'd say, very much uh, almost as his, uh, his daughter, Emer, described him as under house arrest. The yeah. tribunal had, was proceeding with its investigations into the source of his money, and I gave him a ring from Malahide and I said, are you around? Do you mind if I call in? And so we were sitting down and I said to him, you know, you'd want to commission somebody to write a book or do a documentary on you because your, your legacy and your life would be defined by the tribunals as you look at it uh, then. So he decided it wasn't a bad idea, but he, he asked me to make a few suggestions and I said, well, I, I don't know, but I said, I'll do it myself if you think, if you're desperate and you can't find somebody yeah. else. But, uh, How did you respond to that? He said, uh, that wouldn't be a bad idea. He said, but I think you're a minister, so that might be yeah, a problem. Not so a runner. I said, not a runner, really. Yeah. It wasn't for me, but I was, I was so busy in the job and everything. But it was quite interesting. And then, How was he at that stage? Because he was under siege, as you say, because he was being found out, essentially, and his legacy was being thrashed, yeah. uh, and, and yeah. rightly or wrongly, depending on where you are in that argument. But what was his state of mind? How was his mood? Well, do you know, the one thing that was very interesting about Charlie, no matter what you think about him, he was hugely intellectually capable person. He was a really interesting person to have a conversation with. Like, I remember going out on one occasion and we, we were talking about books or something and he, he started talking about books and often when you see people with books in their study you think they just have them there to show but he was able to discuss and read the content of the books that he was reading mm. and ask for an opinion. A very interesting, very fascinating yes. at an intellectual level uh, man, you know, and, and you know, a lot of people at the time when he was in power used to think that this, this thing with him and the arts and literature, poetry, archaeology, yeah, that it was something yeah. he was putting on just to kind of impress people that they should vote for him or something. But yeah. in fact, it was, it was really very genuine. You could have very lengthy discussions with him on very cerebral subjects, which yeah. I found, you know, it was very, very interesting the to house. me. The house, the mansion. Yeah, I mean, extraordinary. I was never there. So you, when you're going up the driveway <laughs> to this place, I mean, it's almost laughable, but it's it, not that funny. So well, no, in, but, a say, in a sense, I mean, I'm not being sanctimonious. We'll get to where, yes, who paid yes. for the house in a minute. Yes. Uh, but tell well, me, he paid for it. But yeah, with whose money? Exactly. Uh, so <laughs> tell, tell me about getting into the house and, and what you're looking at when you're there. But you go down a lovely tree-lined avenue. It's a very straight avenue. And then you turn left and you're, you're into the house. And it's a lovely uh, the Georgian building that was refashioned, apparently, in the 18th century by James Gandon, who everybody would know, I suppose, from the Custom House and all the iconic... Uh, uh, architecture of Dublin, so it, it, it's a period house, but it's very yeah. much done up as a family home. That's the, yes. It's very tastefully done. That's the one yeah. thing that strikes you when you go but through it's that. With stables and, and land and, and, and portraits. You know, I think right, you say in the yes. book there's a big portrait, of, there was at least, of him as soon as you get there in the was, door. There was, there was. says a lot. That, that was a bit over the top, all right? Do you think? <laughs> well, it's just that you'd come in the main door originally the, when I first went there and it would be there. Yeah. But he also, I think, had a bust of Lester Piggott or something like that. He had a bust of Lester Piggott out there as well and a few, a few kind of bronzes and of different kind. And some of the stuff was given to him and then some of it he actually commissioned himself, which, right. again, isn't always pointed out that whatever about the money and where it was coming from, he was certainly purchasing objets d'art or bronzes yeah. and, and commissioning uh, serious Irish sculptors to do pieces for mm. him as well. I was which, going to wait till... You know, to, uh, it's just, people kind of say, well, yeah, well, he could afford it, etc. But, yeah. but the reality was that was very important to some artists at times, you know, you know to get a commission yeah. from somebody who's very important, you know, for somebody, you know, there's not a lot of money no, there I appreciate for that, but of course, stuff, there wasn't know? probably a lot of money there for him if it wasn't for the generosity of the other head the balls that were the, feeding his appetite. Right, right. So let's talk a little bit about that. I was going to wait till later in the chat, but mm. because it's come up now about yeah. six times in the course of six minutes, <laughs> let's get into it. Um, when he was a, 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 a Taoiseach, a minister of Taoiseach, he was amassing all this wealth and all these, uh, right. this grandeur you've been discussing and Abjay right. Dar and other things like that. And it seems from, to, to me, looking back, that 
everyone, no one asks questions uh, with any seriousness, apart from perhaps Vincent Brown at one stage, who was like Cassandra, standing up roaring about it and no one actually paying attention to him. That, in some way. But why didn't anyone ask questions? Well, they did. I mean, I remember in my own period as a journalist yeah. covering Hawaii because, you know, it wasn't just that I had the relationship through the family and the father and that. You know, I actually covered him day to day at one stage. People were always asking about it, and in, in we call the press media circles. Yeah. But also, I think at the time, people kind of knew about it but didn't want to raise it. I mean, it was a very yeah. strange well, thing because well, the, you said if Vincent Brown was one of the few people, yeah. and people, I didn't know the rest of the press corps, you say, you know, there's Vincent again. And, and I, I try to deal with this in the book. And I think what I would say about this is that it seemed like people wanted to believe that he was some sort of mogul or that he was right. some sort of expression of what they all wanted to be, live in a big house, do have so the So they were lifestyle. suspending so, their questioning of Yes, it yeah, to, I, that, to, that to was my impression. Sort of that was my impression. I mean, people would jokingly refer to the money and the affluence and where it was coming from. But in, in effect, nobody uh, was really serious about investigating it, with the honourable exception of Vincent yeah. Brown, were, were who said... To... Put the finger up, hang on a second now, you, you can't be doing that on were a Were you TV able to establish, for, for, for the subject of the book, hmm? were you able to establish at any point then, from majority, can you remember off the top of your head, how much money ultimately how he was receiving in payments from wealthy Lord, businessmen? You've caught me there, but I think, I think in the, 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 amount, the, the actual amount was 14, but I think... The, 14? The 14 million over the lifetime of his political career. And I think then, if I'm right in quoting my own book, A, that was equated by some formulation done by the tribunal to yeah. be equivalent to 40 million at the time the tribunal report was published. 40 million in... In, 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 the, in we call it contemporary, at the time of the publication yeah. report, they equated it through a formulation which some people have questioned, of course, but it was an actual 14 million uh, given to him over a period of donations, by donators, by... benefactors, you know, call them what you want, yeah. business people, so whatever. So he was a so, kept man, essentially. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's effectively the, the, the conclusion you can only kept to, yes. Like, you, it, it touches you deeply uh, in the sense that when your father was ill, uh, you're, you're, you talk about Charles Hawhey emotional reaction. We'll deal with the financial mm. in a moment. Yes. But his, his emotional reaction was what? When he heard that your dad was... Exactly, when he burst into tears. I think Catherine Butler describes this in that, again, very groundbreaking series done here in RT by Mint Productions, that she, he burst into tears when he heard that my father had... Were you surprised had, by that reaction? No, he was quite an emotional man. I mean, you know, everybody had this idea that he was some frozen figure, you know, austere and determined and almost dictatorial, but he was actually none of that in private. He was a very warm person. So that and, was... And I think one of the big things that was qu quite interesting about Hoy was that if you felt intimidated by him or his presence yes. or his austerity or his manners, then you were or did tend to be bullied by him. But people who stood up to him or people whom he felt were his intellectual equals, yes. he was completely okay with. You know, so it's a kind of okay. a, 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 a different... So, some simple figures I want to deal with, with, and I mean this respectfully in your father's memory, oh, but yes, when, yeah. when your dad was, was sick, Charles Hawhey decided to set up a fund to, to, help, make, uh, to help get the liver transplant right, sorted right, out. Yeah. The, the fund accumulated in total what number? What, what? You've caught me there but with the numbers. It's, it's, it's a significant sum of money. It's about 220,000, isn't yeah, that roughly the, the key point is it was oversubscribed. Well, let's just but, say 200 yeah, is a round of figure. Cost of How much was the operation? I think it was 60 or 70. 60, 70. And, um, and the rest of the money went? Into this fund. In, no, but the, the, the fund, once your father's oh, operation... Yeah, once, paid, the, where, once the expenses were defrayed, yeah. they were put into some private account of his or an election account. Or, uh, certainly, they weren't kept in the same account. And did, 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 did the Charles tribunal to, reported on this did, did very extensively. pocket it? Well, that's what the tribunal said, yes. And, of course, he's obviously, and the, and the family, I think, after it's have issued statements, questioning the wisdom of the tribunal in this regard. But it does look, and certainly the, the, the tribunal is fairly definitive about that, that the money raised was inappropriately defrayed for other purposes. But it was a situation where the fund, or the people who came to help with that were, uh, it was an oversubscribed fund. How do you feel about that in retrospect? Well, obviously, I think uh, at the end of the day, he didn't handle that uh, particularly well, I would have thought. And it wasn't, I deal with this in the book, that this seems to have been a pattern where he made presumptions about monies raised in one side yeah. and then spending it in another area. I think the same issue came up with regard to the leader's account. This was the money voted by the Dáil to support the, the leader of opposition, and it still goes on yeah. to this day, but it's obviously tightened up nowadays. But yeah. in those days, it was very loose. And as we know, the Charvet shirts and all the rest, he was defraying it on that. So, I mean, for us as a family, it wasn't such a big issue because actually 
how he was actually hugely supportive of my father in that time. When, you know, he, in a great enthusiasm, said, we've got to get the money, to raise the money for Brian to have his operation. So yes. we weren't privy to who was giving the money even, you know. So we, we were, you know, in the blind, if you like, about that. If, so, if, we, if, we, if we go but, back... But the main point we yes, would yes. say is that... <laughs> you know, the sometimes the media paid. say you should be angry that this money no, wasn't. I, didn't, I wasn't it's not our, I was interested in No, no, but just opinion. to be clear yeah, about yeah, that, yeah. it wasn't our money, and, and my father got the vital yeah, operation. I, I appreciate that, but it's so, just, just you know, to comment on. No, Another thing I want to ask you about, obviously, is the presidential election, which your father was on the cusp of winning at one point, yes, which yes, was yes, all, oh, went yes, on to be yeah. won by Mary Robinson. But, right. but uh, there was this, this, uh, uh, this terribly tense time, obviously, because uh, your, your father had got into this situation with mature recollection and whether or not oh, he had yes, called uh, right. Patrick Hillary. Right. So don't need to get into that detail. What I'm more interested in is the fact that uh, Charlie Hoy said that uh, Brian Lennon, my friend of 30 years, <laughs> and he had the choice. Was he going to sack him That's or would right. your father resign? Now, tell me about being in a helicopter over that Gandon mansion and uh, landing on, was, was, uh, on the helipad. But it was actually, it was almost like so, a scene from a Bond movie. We had been campaigning Or The down. Godfather. Uh, well, I don't know, pick your movie metaphors, but we were, we were down campaigning in, in, in the Midlands and I chose to accompany my father with my brother and we flew into Concilia and it is an extraordinary view when you see this wonderful estate with the lake and the whole thing. But we're landing and as, as, and as we're waiting for the, my father to go in and meet him and we're, then he goes in, we're meeting, we're sitting down in a room, we're hearing in the media reports that there's no intention. My friend of 30 years, we have no intention of asking him to resign. And when my father comes out of the meeting, with Roy, he says, what do you think of that, guys? And it's a letter saying, it's all my fault, I'm resigning. Yeah. <laughs> so we were quite, I don't think you can sign that. But of course, he was kind of looking at it and saying, well, should I do it? And I think his campaign manager, Michael Dawson, said, no, I think actually your, your campaign dies if you sign that yeah. letter, because it was like almost mea culpa. I'm totally to blame for my own situation, yeah. and it's got nothing to well, do with ultimately. Mr. Hoy. But, but the farce of it all was then, of course, that that was kind of, you know, like any politician, keeping his options open. So he got back on the chopper. We went back down to Longford and we jumped on a bus and we were campaigning around the Midlands and he kind of showed the letter to my mother and my mother <laughs> looked at the, at so, the thing and said whoosh, 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 whoosh. <laughs> and that's, that's new in the book. That's never been she said She ripped before. it off and said forget about it. She just said you're just not doing that yeah. Brian. I was like, don't, even, don't even raise the point with me. Which was quite But he was so. ultimately sacked so, as we know yes. and, and uh, the letter came by with the two guard outriders that's dramatically right, yeah, delivering yeah, the letter into yeah. your home. Um, when you, you, I, I just get the sense to talking to you, you're, you're almost protective of Hawhey, which is, which is I, I'm getting... I would say protective, but I would say that, like, having sort of almost grown up with him in the sense that he was always a presence in our life, in our family, uh, and then he was very good to tell. I mean, just to kind of illustrate the point, he was at my dad's wedding to my mother, and then he was at my older brother Brian's wedding to his wife, yeah. you know. So, like, he was very much part of the family in an extended sense. So, and, and my father and him, and of course, Don O'Malley, were huge friends in the yeah. 1960s when Ireland was going through a, a, another phase of modernization and improvement and stuff. So, it's very hard to be kind of blinkered, you know, and yeah. say one issue or one failing, as we would see it, say, in terms of the presidential election and the trauma around that, to kind of say that defines him. He so, was, so to coin a phrase the, from your own father, you're, you're looking at the totality of the relationships. Is that fair to the say? The totality of yeah, the, yeah. the relationship was, I would say, broadly positive. Do you want to run... In, in relation to my father, I mean, he had a very good career. He was appointed to very significant positions by high, and I trusted him. And, and in fairness, my father, while he had reservations about him in certain respects, he did feel, because my father spent a lot of his time as a foreign minister, that oh, he was a person you could put in front of foreign statesmen and he would not let this country down okay. in terms of how we perform, behave, negotiate. I could talk to you for a long time. There's Sorry. so much more to talk about. Okay. Unfortunately, we okay. have to go. go. Are, you, are you going to run in uh, Roscommon? Are you still interested in running for the Dáil? I'm not saying I'm interested. I said <laughs> I'm open and available if people want me to and run. do they want you to run? I don't think so in Roscommon. I, I think they're all dropping off like flies down Okay, there. so where's next? The other candidates, I mean, so... Where's your next? Well, to next is just build my business career and pay the bills like yourself and anybody else. Well, you're not going there, to run tonight. somewhere else in hmm? Ireland? Are Dublin somewhere? I doubt it, really. I think, I think the party, the pit of all that is, have, have a good selection of candidates you're now. You're feeling so a little unloved. Not at all, not at all. At this stage in my life, I've been spent 14 years in the doll. It's not something you kind of rush back into, okay. to be quite honest okay, with you. Okay, okay. Listen, congratulations <laughs> on the book. Eminently readable take on a fascinating Please, figure, whether you, uh, wherever you are on that subject. I'm sorry I didn't bring the guitar, okay? Next time, <laughs> next time. Conor Lennon and Lady Dunn. Thank you, Conor. All right, Conor will be signing copies of Hawhey, Prince of Power. That's the book there. He'll be signing at...
12 o'clock midday in Rathfarnham Bookshop and at 2.30 in the Eastons in Blanchester. We had a lot more to talk about there, but unfortunately the clock is against us.